If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Exodus this morning. The book of Exodus in the Old Testament. And uh, looking at what God has for us today. And if we have a little title today, it'll be called God Came Down. But before God came down, He, he was up. So uh, that's kind of what we're going to look at there in Exodus. And specifically, He was up on a mountain called Mount Sinai. And we want to take a little glimpse in Exodus of the glimpse that His Word gives us of Himself. And uh, we know that God brought His children out of Egypt, out of slavery. He led them through the Red Sea on dry ground. That's sort of the context of where we're at in Exodus this morning. And then He brings them to the foot of this mountain where He is, Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And He descends onto the mountaintop. And He shows people just as much as He can of Himself without killing them. Uh, and we want to look at four sections of that because it's important to understand who God is and just get a, real, a, little, a little glimpse of who He is so that when we understand who He is, how it affects our lives when He came down. So let's look at four sections. I'm going to start with chapter 19, verses 16 through 20. So if you'll go there, we'll start with Exodus 19. And chapter 19, verse 16 through 20. And we're going to read four sections just in the time we have of uh, sort of how the people saw God on this mountaintop. If you can imagine yourself uh, there, have a little mental picture of, okay, you, you've seen God do a lot, but now you're coming to the mountain of God and you're going to see a little bit of Him. So... Uh, that's where his people were at that time. So let's look at that. Exodus 19, starting with verse 16, God's word says this. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunderings, there were lightnings. There was a thick cloud on the mountain. The sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Can you get a picture of that? Can you imagine yourself there at this huge mountain, and there are thunderings and lightnings and fire and smoke like you've never seen before and the entire mountain is quaking, is shaking. Verse 19, when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Verse 20, then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Uh, now, that's the first section. I want to give you four. Skip over now to chapter 20. And we want to read verses 18 through 21. We don't have time to go through uh, all these chapters in Exodus, but just to give us a little glimpse of sort of what his people were seeing and experiencing there, uh, seeing a glimpse of God and his glory. So this is chapter 20, verse 18. Please follow along there. Exodus 20, verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thundering, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. And they said to Moses, I love this part, You speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. I mean, that's where we were. You understand where they were. They were, it was such an incredible display of power that they were, they were afraid to get any closer. And so they said, listen, Moses, you talk to us. God will talk to you. You talk to us, and that will be good. We're afraid if we get any closer, if we talk to God, we will just die. We can't take this. So verse 20, Moses says to the people, do not fear. Uh, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Verse 21, so the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Now, third section. Go to chapter 24. Please go to chapter 24. And I hope you'll study this whole section uh, during the week on your own. But now we're in chapter 24. We're going to start with verse 16. Again, these are just glimpses.
glimpses of God on top of this mountain. Chapter 24, verse 16. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it six days. On the seventh day, God called Moses, and he called him out of the, uh, he called from the midst of the cloud. Verse 17, the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Think of that. Verse 18, so Moses went into the midst of the cloud, and he went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, now let's go to the fourth section, chapter 33. You can start to see maybe why uh, in another section of Exodus the people thought that once he, Moses was up there 40 days and 40 nights, he was gone. He was consumed. Uh, it was a consuming fire. It, the whole mountain is shaking. So and after two, three weeks, whatever it was, uh, you know, they, they thought, man, he's not coming back. That's... Uh, God is, is kind of scaring a little bit with his power. This is the last section I want you to follow along with chapter 33. And verse 18 says this. And he said, please show me your glory. This is Moses talking directly with God. He's like, listen, I want to see more. He goes up into the consuming fire. He goes up to the top of the mountain. Everybody else was afraid. And God called Moses and he comes up to the top of the mountain. And he actually says, show me more. I want more. Show me your glory. Verse 19, then God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no man shall see me and live. But the Lord said, <clears throat> Here's what I'm going to do for you, my friend, since you've asked this request. Here's a place by me, and you shall stand on this rock. And so it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face will you shall not see. Can you imagine that? I mean, he couldn't see his face. I mean, that, that's the holiness of God that cannot even look on sin. I mean, we just we need to get a little glimpse of who God is. In our day and age, we, we've watered God down to just this, this guy who, lo who just loves us no matter what, which is true, but just doesn't care what we do because he's forgiven us for our sins. That's not God. That's not God. Yes, He loves us no matter what we do. Yes, He forgives us for our sins. But He wants us to be holy because He's holy. Are you with me? I mean, He wants us to be holy. He's got a special place called heaven where no sin can enter. That's how big of a deal it is. We've talked about that before. But you can't even see His face until we get to heaven. You can't even see His face. So, but, but Moses is so in love. With God, his friend. And he says, I tell you what, I'll show you my back. I'm going to cover you while I go by because you'll explode. <laughs> you'll die. But I'll let you see my back just for a second because you're my friend. And I'm going to do this for you. It's an amazing, amazing scene here. Uh, please, please listen as, as we just get that little glimpse of God, and he's up there, and that was the whole Old Testament. That was the whole Old Testament. God is up there. He's on that mountaintop. We're down here. We know that Jesus Christ came so God would come down. Amen? But we need to remember who, who God is. As amazing as all of this is, please catch this. All that the Israelites saw and experienced, and all that Moses saw and experienced, and, and remember what they saw. All the, all the plagues and the miracles in Egypt that brought them out with, with the Egyptians giving them gold and silver on the way out. Just get out. Think what you want. Just get out. And then the Red Sea party, and they walked through on dry ground. Can you imagine it? All of those things pale in comparison to what we have today, and that's Jesus living in me. Do we understand that? Is God coming down? 
and living in me, living in you. All of those miracles are amazing and awesome. They're all on the outside. They're all just stuff you see. Maybe you get to experience a little bit. But Moses didn't have Jesus Christ in his heart like you do. Do you understand that? That's God with all his power, all his consuming fire that makes mountains tremble. Amen? That, that puts worlds into existence. And he can be living in your heart. It's the same God with the same power in you. Amen? Amen? Amen. It's greater than seeing all this stuff that they saw. It's in you now. That, that God and His power and His love, all that God has is in you. It pales in comparison. And this morning what we want to talk about is God coming down and the amazing things that it brings to our lives because He's not on the mountaintop anymore. He's with us. Amen? He's with us. Jesus came down. He came down. So I want to give you four things this morning in the time that we have that talk about what it means that he came down. What, okay, we're, we're just so excited that he came down. What does that mean like to my everyday life in a practical way? So please, let me give you some things, four things in particular, that deal with what it means that he came down. Number one, first and foremost, what it means that he came down is that we don't have to go up. We don't have to go up. Guess what? We can't go up. We can't go up. That's what that means. We can't go up to the mountaintop. We're just like the children of Israel. I mean, Moses was the rare exception. The rest of us, we have to, that's what we are. We have to stay away. In other words, we can't get into heaven without God doing something to help us. Are you with me? We can't go up to Him. Think about it. It's a good thing, actually, because we don't have to try to be like Moses, try to be like a super Christian, just to have a relationship with God. He came down to me, to my level, right where I'm at. Because we can never get to His level. His level is perfect. Again, so perfect He can't look on sin or it come into His presence. We can never go up to God. And, and really what we're talking about is we can never be good enough to get into heaven. We can never be good enough to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can't do it. We just can't do it. And you know, like I know, that so many people think that they're good, and they're good enough. I love the part of that here again, here again song where we just sang, and the first part of that chorus says, I'm not enough. I mean, we've got to come to that place, don't we? Where we realize, I'm not enough. I'm not good enough to get into heaven. Uh, years ago, and I'll, I'll, you know, if I had to wager a bet, which I'm not a wagering person, but if I had to wager a bet, I would say it's still the number one response that people give. Uh, when you ask them if they're going to heaven when they die, do you believe you're going to go to heaven when you die? Most people say yes. What's the number one response when you ask them why? Because I'm a good person. Because they're a good person. Please understand this morning. We can't be good enough. No one is good enough to get into heaven. No one is good enough to see God in all His glory and His holiness. Amen? Amen. We, we can't go up. <laughs> he had to come down. We've got to understand that not only for ourselves, but for people we know. Family members, loved ones, neighbors, co-workers, people all around us that think, I'm a good person, I'll make it. That's not what God's Word says. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short. Fall short of the glory of God. Fall short. Can't do up. <laughs> we all fall short. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. Heaven came down. God came down. Amen? If we believe and receive Jesus Christ, He makes us good enough. It's only Him. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. He makes us good enough. He clothes us with His clothes of righteousness. We can't go up. We can't be good enough. No one can on their own. But 
praise God, he came down. Amen? Hey, number two, what else does it mean that he came down? I love this part. I love this part. It means that we, we can't go up. We don't have to go up. We don't have to go anywhere. He came down to us, number one. Number two, it means that we become his children. We become his children. And please understand, it's another, I don't know what you'd call it, a misconception, probably, that people have that we're all God's children. Let me tell you something. We're not all God's children. You have to be adopted in. You have to be brought in by believing and receiving Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And then you're in. And then you become his children. Let me read to you Romans 8, 14 through 17. It's probably familiar to a lot of you. Romans 8, 14 through 17. Please jot that down. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But please listen. You receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba. Intimate. It's like saying as a little kid to your father, Daddy or Papa. Amen? 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 That's what we receive and believe. The Spirit himself in verse 16 of Romans 8 bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Verse 17, and if children, then that means we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. If we indeed suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Do we even have a breath of understanding regarding the privilege we have in being adopted by God? By the God of the universe. And he's brought us in, even though we don't deserve to be in. Are you with me? We don't deserve it. We could never earn it. We could never be good enough to get in. And he has said, come. Come in. Be, be, a, be a child of mine. And not only that, joint heirs with Jesus. Inheriting it all in heaven for eternity. I want to tell you a real quick story that one of our speakers told at our uh, council in Orlando uh, a month ago or so. Uh, this speaker was with his father, who lived in Atlanta, and he was joking around with his father, and he asked him if he had been removed from his will. Uh, his father didn't have a lot of money, a lot of uh, inheritance, you know, land, buildings, whatever. And so he was joking around with his dad, uh, I guess he had teased him about something, and and he uh, joked around and asked him, uh, have you removed me from the will? And he said, I'll never forget what my dad said, because he said, no, but I could. And so, you know, he laughed about that. That, that wasn't the important part. He laughed and said, well, of course, you could remove all of us kids if you wanted to. And then his dad said, no, I can't. I can't remove all of you. Please get this. Georgia State law says that once a child is put on a will, he or she cannot be removed if the child is adopted. Think about that. If the child is not adopted, they can be removed. I don't know why that's a law, but that's Georgia State law. So if you have any adopted children and you live in Georgia, you're safe. You are safe. Or if you're an adopted child in Georgia, if your, your parents put you in the will, they can't take you out. That can never happen. But the natural children, you can take them out. They take you off. <laughs> I don't know. And he paused for a minute and he went, oh my goodness. But think about that because I, I, I'll be honest with you. I think all of us have a little bit lower view of adoption than we should. Are you with me? I mean, it's, a, it's the same way with God. When we're adopted in, it's a big deal. God says, guess what? Nobody can snatch you out of my hand. Amen? 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 We don't need to look at being adopted by God as being some kind of second-rate anything. It's first-rate. It's amazing. It's becoming His true child, becoming a child of God. Because He came down, we can become a child of God. Do we have too little of an understanding 
about being adopted into the family of God, do we understand the great, amazing, miraculous privilege we have to call God our true, real, genuine Abba, Daddy, Papa, Father. Amen? Amen? Look back at verse 15 of Romans chapter 8 that we just read. For just a moment it says, You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But when you receive Christ, what do you receive? You receive the spirit of adoption. By whom we cry out, cry out, Abba, Father, an intimate name. We call our one true Heavenly Father because we have become children of God. Number three this morning and what it means that he came down. It also means that we can have his eyes. Because God came down, we can have his eyes. Please catch this. If God stays on the mountaintop, I can only see him and everyone else through my own eyes. Please listen. I can only see through my own experience, my own understanding. But because he came down, because he came in my life, he gives me his eyes to see as he sees. Amen? We can't have his eyes if we are not his children. You've probably seen some children of parents who have just really matching eyes. Have you ever seen that? You're like, wow, I've got, she's got her mother's eyes or, or got her father's eyes. Guess what? We cannot have our Heavenly Father's eyes unless we receive his son Jesus into our heart. But when we do, we have his eyes to see him the way we should, to see others the way we should. Are you with me? To see as he sees. Please listen to this. When I view God with my eyes, let's be honest, I see questions because I can't see him. I mean, let's just be honest. When, we, when we're talking about God, thinking about God, if we are seeing him, viewing him with our own fleshly eyes and wisdom, we, it's just a lot of questions. We, we have a lot of questions, nothing wrong with questions, but we don't have a lot of answers. But when we see God and view Him with His eyes, with His perspective, because He's in our hearts, I see purpose. I see His movement. I see, in fact, Him moving all around. Him working all around. I see purpose. Think for a moment about how you view God. If I don't have a close relationship with Him, if I'm constantly viewing him and everything else through just merely my human eyes, my human understanding, there's always going to be more questions than answers. And man, is that frustrating. But if I'm viewing God and everything else and everybody else through his eyes, he enables me to see so much more. And it's so important that we see purpose in our lives every day. Amen? Not just random chance. I mean, random chance, if that's my whole life, whew, what a life. But man, if I see purpose every day in my life and, and in those around me, as I see him working all around me, I see possibilities all around me, that's a whole other ballgame. Amen? Uh, most of us understand that when we talk about a child's behavior, Especially if it is really, really bad behavior on a continual basis. Most of us understand that that is a symptom of a deeper problem, right? Most of the time, if you have a child who is behaving badly on a regular basis, continual, 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 there's usually something under that. There's usually a reason for that. It's not just because he likes being bad all the time, although sometimes that may be. But most of the time, there's something else there, right? There's something else there. God's eyes enables us to see something else there. Are you with me? When we look at people, we don't look at them just as, as, as like, like we're, they are there to, to help us, to bless us, to, to be used by us. We see people as God sees, people that, hey, how can I bless them? How can I help them? How can I strengthen them? Are you with me? Please don't 
fall into the consumer, hear me, the consumer attitude, the consumer mindset that our culture cultivates every day and every way. Consumerism. Everything is just about us consuming. And it's coming to the church sometimes where we view church as something to be consumed rather than a place to go where God consumes me. Amen? So we pick and choose things. That's great at a grocery store. <laughs> Got lots of options, right? But man, let's just talk about church. Do we, do we come to church just to pick and choose? No, we come to hear from Him. We come to worship Him. We come to be a part of the family of God, to use our gifts and talents. Not, not merely to consume things, if I like this or I don't like that. Because it's all about Him. It's not all about me. Are you with me? We've got to have our Father's eyes to see those things. When we see people, think about when you see circumstances. It's totally different when you're looking through flesh-centered eyes. What are we going to see in circumstances? We're only going to see superficially. We're only going to see those things outwardly. But guess what? We'll see deep things in our circumstances. We'll see purposes. We'll see deeper reasoning, have deeper understanding with our Father's eyes. I uh, remember our first house that we ever bought, and my wife and I saw it totally differently, to totally differently. My wife didn't want to buy it, she didn't want to live there, because it was run down, it was a fixer-upper. And I saw it in the paper, and I said, let's go see it, we get the realtor, we go see it, standing out the street, she's like, this is run down, I don't want to live here. I am seeing, hey, we can fix this up, it's got some potential. I'm sorry, honey, usually I give great illustrations about you. But she, we just saw it differently. It's not that bad, it's not bad, it's just different, right? I'm like, let's go inside. She's like, I don't want to go inside. I'm like, come on, come on. Go inside. We get inside and it's worse. It's worse. <coughs> Excuse me. But it was just cosmetic, you know what I mean? It was just paint and some things and drywall and stuff like that. It was cosmetic. The structure was fine. And my wife said, can we go now because I don't want to live here. Down. And I'm like, oh, I can see this and this. I can see we can really fix this up. And then I said, let's go back back out outside because there's there's supposed to be a pool out there. And she's like, I'm staying here. I don't even want to go any farther. I'm like, well, come on, let's go see the pool. So they got an in-ground pool, and there's stuff growing up through it. There's trees. There's shrubs. And she's like, it's time to go. <laughs> And you know what I was thinking? I bet I could get my lawnmower down there. And I could, I could, I could get that. I took my lawnmower down there, did I not? I mean, that's how bad it was. I needed a liner. The liner was gone. Anyway. But she trusted me. She trusted me. We bought that house. We sold it for a whole bunch more than we bought it for. Paid off our school loans. I mean, four years into marriage, we were dead free. Because, you know, we, you, you got to be able to see. You know, if you see stuff like that, boy, it really helps how you can see the potential. Please let God speak to your heart this morning. Because he came down, because he's inside us, we can see differently. Amen? We don't just see a person and that, oh, they're a jerk. We see, I wonder why they're a jerk. You know what I mean? I, I wonder why, what I could do to help them not be a jerk. I'll bet Jesus could change them and they wouldn't be a jerk anymore. Amen? Because Jesus is the answer to every problem we have. Are you with me? Do you believe that? Amen? With our Father's eyes, we see people. We see circumstances differently. We don't see circumstances as just, I'm going through this really awful circumstance and I just want to get on the other side and get through it. So just take it away from me, Lord. There's nothing wrong with praying and asking God to take away problems. But as we are in them, whatever the circumstance is, do we see it as God sees it, His eyes? What do you want me to learn through this? Right? How can I grow through this? There's got to be some reasoning behind it if God's let me go through it. We can see through our Father's eyes. Please catch this as we draw our thoughts to a close this morning. A little more on our Father's eyes. Circumstances that come our way. 
circumstances that come our way? Do we complain? Do we hold a grudge? Do we just try to survive? Or do we see through our Father's eyes and remain thankful? Ask the Lord to teach us, to grow us, to see the purpose in it. With people, do we see deeper than that first layer? Do we see them for how they could be with God in their life? Let God speak to your heart. That's what it's all about. Amen? What people could be like if Jesus would just get in their life. Amen? Do we see that? Do we see that? What about today? Do we look for purpose today? Each day, do we stay thankful, strive to be holy and righteous because we know it matters? What about our culture? Have you thought about, do we even think about our culture and whether it lines up with God's word or not? Because much of it does not. Do we just roll along in our culture doing what everybody else does? Because we're just look, looking through our fleshly eyes or do we see through our Father's eyes and see what He wants us to be? And that is to be different, to act different, to react different, to speak different, to live different. As we see through His eyes. I want to give you uh, one fourth point this morning in closing. What it means that He came down. Lastly, but... Most importantly, I think, it means that you are not alone. It means that you are not alone. I want to read to you Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39. I hope you'll turn there. Romans 8, 31 through 39. Please jot it down if you don't turn there, but... Romans 8.31 says this, What then shall we say to these things? And really we can just stop with verse 31. Because what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Do I hear an amen? I mean, that's the bottom line. If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, Think about that, especially if you have a son or a daughter, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That's you. It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. He's even sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for us. And here's the greatest part of this, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or famine, I'm sorry, or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But verse 37 says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? More than a conqueror, not just survivor, a conqueror and then son. Verse 38 and 39 says this, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing created shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. You are not alone. Never, ever alone. Someone I was talking to last week uh, just really just, just, uh, discouraged and just feeling like this person was all alone. And I just have to take that person to this scripture to be reminded that nothing and no one can separate you from the love of Christ. If you have Christ in your heart, you are never alone. We've just got to get it through our heads and trust him enough that he is more than enough for anything that comes our way. 
Because I think that's what, that's what happens when, when he doesn't answer our prayer the way we want him to. We think he's not there. We think he doesn't care. But no one cares more. Amen? There's no one that cares more. No one. The fact and truth that God came down means that you are not alone. As we grow as first newborn babes in Christ toward becoming mature believers, our relationship with the God of the universe hopefully grows closer and closer. And soon we, soon we find that knowing about Him is not enough. We want to know Him. Knowing about Him would be like standing at that foot of that mountain. That's a little scary. <laughs> I'm not going any closer. But do we want to know him? And Moses did. Moses said, I'm coming. I don't care if I get burnt by the consuming fire. I'm coming. And then once he just got a glimpse of him, he wanted more. That's the way it is in the Christian life. Amen? The closer we get to him, the more of him we want. Please consider this as we close. We know. We know for sure that he's the lover of our soul. When, my, when our thoughts about heaven are not so much about the, the streets of gold or the mansions, all those good things, no more pain, amen, no more pain, no more suffering, no more night, all those awesome things about heaven. But we know, we know that we know that we know that he's the lover of our soul. When our thoughts about heaven are about him, I can't wait to see him. I can't wait to be with him. Amen. Would you bow your head with me? We're going to close the word. With every head bowed and every eye closed, please just take a moment and spend it with the Lord. He knows right where you are. He knows our needs before we even ask Him. And in the quietness of this moment, just do some business with God and let Him know that you heard Him if He spoke to you today. If he moved you in any way, let him know. Let him know. Thank you that he came down. All these things are a part of our lives because he's in our life. But before we go any further, I just have to ask, do you know him? Man, there's a lot of people that know about him. A lot of people know about him. But do you really know Him? The first step is asking Jesus to come into your heart to repent of your sins. Ask Him to forgive you a clean slate. And start a new walk. A walk in newness of life, as God's Word says. If you've never done that, I want to pray for you this morning. Just before we close, if God spoke to your heart today, you've never accepted the Lord, and you know He's really... He's speaking to you, and today is your day. Would you just slip your hand up, and by that you're saying, Pastor Tim, pray for me. I'm ready. I'm ready. I want to know him. I want to know him more. Anybody at all, before we go any further, just slip your hand up and slip it down and say, Pastor Tim, pray for me before we go any further. All right, amen. Tell me, Father, thank you so much for all you do, for all you are. Thank you for coming down. As we close in prayer right now, dear Heavenly Father, help us to grasp the distance that you came to come down, to be in our lives, the, the sinless, to be a part of our sinful lives. The holiness of God, just so completely holy. But yet you want to make your home in our hearts. Man, to have a relationship with us, you want to you want to talk to us. You want to speak to us. You have a purpose for us, Lord, that's greater than just making money and having a house and a car. Lord, there's so much to life in Christ every day. We thank you for how much you love us and how much you care. Heavenly Father, help each one of us today to be thankful and to draw closer to you to know you more. Thank you for coming down and being in our lives. Help, help us, Lord, to make you not a part of our lives, but number one in our lives. We love you. We thank you. We praise you.
And we pray all these things in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Amen. 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 Thank you for coming, everybody. God bless you. Go in peace.